given the discontinuity that is found in biological world among organisms, our next question is where did that come from? What is the origin of discontinuity? In uh, the naturalistic worldview, the discontinuity that we find in life arose, like everything else in biology, through the process of evolution. The basic idea of evolution is that the, at one time in Earth history, there was only one organism, uh, not more than one organism, not more than one type, and that through time that organism changed into other organisms, ultimately branching a number of times to produce the diversity of life that we have today. In this particular perspective of history, uh, there is no true discontinuity because, in fact, every species that is found today can be traced back uh, to a common ancestor. Every apparent discontinuity, has, a stream of discontinuity, has been crossed by organisms somewhere in the past. All organisms in this particular worldview are connected by uh, lineage, by uh, descendancy. So in this particular worldview, deep discontinuities, those that seem not just uh, to be too big a gap to be crossed in the present, have actually never been crossed. If that's true of the deep discontinuities of life, which seems to be the case, then the, um, the deep discontinuities that we see are contrary to the expectations of naturalism are contrary to the uh, expectations of evolution. But even more so, deeper discontinuities, such as we find between groups of created kinds, are even more uh, contrary to evolution and, in turn, naturalism. And of course, the very deepest discontinuity that exists between life and non-life is even more uh, contrary to naturalism and evolution. So it would appear that the evidence we have of Brahmins and groups of Brahmins and life itself, all these higher groupings, are things that did not come about really by the process of evolution. Naturalism is enable, unable to explain them. <clears throat> Besides this uh, observation, though, we have other things that are problematic for the naturalistic worldview. For example, in evolutionary theory, uh, one species uh, breaks apart into two species. There's a time when the two species were, in fact, the same, and then they gradually diverge. What you should see in the world, since this process is supposed to be going on and on all the time, is that there, it should be difficult to define the distinction between two species when they're diverging from each other. At the time when they are, uh, they're just beginning to separate into two species, they should be able to interbreed with each other, and they're probably going to be very difficult to distinguish from one another. That is not what we see in the world about us. When we have examples of two species that are close together, they're very similar to each other, they're sitting next to each other, very often we have a hybrid zone between them indicating they can still interbreed, you would think uh, the intuitive expectation of evolution is that the two species would then be very difficult to distinguish, especially as long as breeding is occurring between them, passing genetic information. It should be kind of swamping out differences. But what we actually see is that when two species are juxtaposed against one another with the hybrid zone, outside of the hybrid zone, they are very distinct. In fact, there are instances where two species extremely similar to one another live in the same place and they have the capacity of interbreeding, though they tend not to, they are very different from one another, easily distinguished from one another. The distinctiveness of species is counter to the intuitive expectations of evolutionary theory. We have a further problem for evolution, which has to do with cultivars, varieties, and breeds. In those cases, as I said, the, a breed or a cultivar or a variety does not exist in the natural world. You re, if, once you form a breed and you release it into the natural world, it quickly disappears. Now you can rebreed them and rediscover, if you wish, that breed, but the, the expression of the breed 
disappears. And, and that's kind of odd. The fact that you can keep bringing it up suggests it's hidden inside the organism and can be expressed by uh, breeding, by control breeding, but that it's never expressed in the natural world. Now that's a problem for evolution because according to evolutionary theory, natural selection chooses what's expressed. It takes the variety that's actually seen in the world and chooses one variety over another. If there's a, let's say, a breed that isn't showing up, it can't be seen by natural selection, natural selection can't choose it. And so there's no, there's no mechanism, there's no known way in evolutionary theory to produce information that is hidden in an organism, that isn't expressed in an organism. But the existence of a breed indicates that there is hidden information in organisms. Evolution has no way to explain the existence of a breed. But we have thousands of breeds, tens of thousands of cultivars, even of just one group like the orchids. So hidden information is extremely common. Evolution expects that there should be very little, if any, hidden information. But in fact, in the biological world, there's a huge amount of, of hidden information in the form. And then we see some of that as we do our breeding and uh, discover those things that are hidden. In addition, there's a further problem related to breeds and cultivars. Since it is hidden information, if anything damages that information, such as a mutation, we're going to get to mutations later, but basically a mutation is a mistake in the genetic material that destroys genetic information. It'll, it has the potential of, of destroying this information of whatever a breed is. Any mutation that occurs in hidden information stays there. It can't be taken out because there's no known mechanism to say, ooh, there's a bad mutation, let's take it out. If a mutation was expressed, if you could see it, then natural selection takes out the, the bad guys, what's, what's messed up, and thus kind of keeps the genome a little bit clean, or at least attempts can begin the process of cleaning the genome of mutations. But if mutations occur in hidden information, there's nothing we know of to take those mutations out. So they'll just simply accumulate. And uh, mutations over time should destroy any information that, uh, that is hidden. So evolution not only has no mechanism to explain how hidden information came to be, it also has no mechanism to explain how, if you ever get hidden information, how it doesn't disappear. It's going to be destroyed by mutation. The existence of thousands upon thousands of breeds, cultivars, and varieties that don't seem to have very much evidence of mutation argues that, in fact, uh, the uh, breeds, cultivars, and varieties did not arise by evolutionary theory. Some other explanation has to be sought for their origin. Also, evolution would expect that <clears throat> in, the, if, in, in addressing the issue of uh, species interbreeding with other species, this might be expected among two, between two species that have just evolved from a common ancestor. For a time, they might be able, one might think, to be able to interbreed, but then lose that ability as they continue to become different, more and more different from one another. So evolution expects interspecific hybridization to be uh, relatively rare and only be expected between two, two sibling species, two sister species in the evolutionary process. You wouldn't expect it between cousins. You wouldn't expect it uh, to persist through time. And again, it should only be rare and between two species that are really, really similar. But what we actually find is something quite different. Interspecific hybrids are extremely common. Within created kinds, let's say within the, within the cats, uh, the cat family, the lions and the tigers and all of that sort of thing, we have a large percentage of the species can interbreed with other members of, the, uh, of that kind. It isn't just the, the species that are really similar to each other, it's in fact a wide variety of organisms across the entire created kind. That is not what is expected by evolutionary theory. So the commonness of interspecific hybrids is contrary to evolutionary theory as well. 
So naturalism, and with it its attendant evolutionary theory, is an extremely difficult time explaining the evidence of discontinuity and the spectrum of discontinuity that exists in the world about us. Uh, the deep discontinuity that we see in among organisms is consistent, however, with the idea of a God who wants to show his distinction, his uniqueness by putting discontinuity in life, by putting deep discontinuity in life, uh, by creating created kinds, Brahmins, that cannot change to another Brahmin, that cannot interbreed with another Brahmin. This discontinuity, deep discontinuity, is is explained by God putting it into life to make that point that God is extremely unique from everything else in the creation. The existence of shallow discontinuity is fascinating. God placed not just discontinuity in life to show his uniqueness, but a spectrum of perfection of discontinuity from extremely shallow to very shallow to to shallow, to deep, to very deep, or semi-deep, to very deep, to extremely deep. He created this spectrum of perfection of discontinuity to not just show his uniqueness, but as we automatically line these up from extremely shallow to extremely deep and project that in our minds, we imagine something even more unique uh, to, and our minds are lifted towards infinity to conclude that there is something that is so different from everything else, far more different from everything else than anything we observe is from anything else, that there is something that is perhaps infinitely different from those things that are made. This is something that is explained by a God who is infinitely different from everything else and wants us to understand that. So God created not just discontinuity, that would explain the deep discontinuity of life that evolution and naturalism cannot explain. But the same God wants us to see his infinite discontinuity with everything else. And so he puts a spectrum of perfection of discontinuity in life, explaining not just the deep discontinuity between created kinds, but in fact the shallow and very shallow all the way up to the, extre you know, the extremely deep. <clears throat> and when you examine this, uh, these discontinuities, it's even more remarkable. Furthermore, in the case of shallow discontinuity, God created shallow continuity to persist even when hybrid zones should destroy it. This is pretty cool. You have two, or two species that are sitting next to each other uh, geographically with a hybrid zone between. When that exists, when that occurs, there's genetic information going back and forth which should swamp the differences. In other words, eventually make the two species the same. But we have examples of hybrid zones that have persisted for, in fact, thousands of years, never changing the discontinuity that exists between the species. The uh, hybrid zone clearly indicates that there's continuity, but in spite of the fact that genetic information should be swamping out the differences, the differences remain. The discontinuity remains. So God has placed discontinuity into life to persist even when it shouldn't. And <laughs> even when things like uh, uh, hybridization should be swamping it out. So he means for us to see this pattern. And it's extremely difficult. It's basically impossible to explain that kind of pattern in naturalism or with evolution. And in the case of varieties and cultivars and breeds, it's even, I would argue, even more amazing. He created discontinuity there that, uh, that doesn't even persist when you uh, release these things into the natural world. There is dis there's discontinuity that you can't explain to evolution that's put, it's hidden. God hid it in organisms, and it's only revealed when humans actually uh, devise a way to reveal it. So he's created discontinuity that is evident in the world, but he's also hidden additional discontinuity and given us the ability to discover it. So when we discover new breeds and varieties and cultivars that don't persist in a natural world, we actually increase the amount of dis discontinuity that can be seen in the world and thus increase the picture. We enhance the picture of discontinuity that God put into the world. 
the um, existence, and also the furthermore, the looking at those hybrid zones, looking at those uh, the the species that can interbreed with other species to produce interspecific hybrids. For two species to be able, even two individuals, to be able to mate with each other and produce offspring means those two organisms have to be very similar. I mean, we've even got human beings that when they get married, they something has happened to prevent them from being able to have children. It's very easy to lose the ability to, uh, uh, to, to have children, to be compatible enough to generate children. So it, should, it, it seems like, intuitively anyway, that two different species uh, have to be really, really similar in order for them to be able to produce hybrids between the two species. And you would think that with time, one or the other of the species is going to change enough that they're not going to be able to, to interbreed with other species. So the, ex the existence of, of two species that can interbreed suggests not only that they're very similar, but that they probably have not been separate very long. They might have been separate for centuries or millennia, thousands of years, but the concept of them being separated for millions of years seems completely out of the question. The fact that we have all of these different species in a single created kind that can interbreed, tens of thousands of orchids, orchid species, can interbreed with one another. That not only suggests that they're probably all uh, very similar and related to each other, but that it hasn't been very long ago that they were all in one group perhaps uh, from one orchid. That suggests that not much time has elapsed since the or first orchid came to be. Uh, that suggests that the earth is young, that life is young. The existence, the, not just the existence, the commonness of interspecific hybrids suggests that life is extremely young and not millions of years old. It is in fact thousands of years old, such as young age creationism suggests. What are we to do with this information? What is our responsibility uh, with the information we've learned about discontinuity? First of all, our responsibility as priests is to know God. And we can learn, I believe, about God by looking at those, uh, those things that are made, by studying, in this case, discontinuity. The more we learn about discontinuity, the more we understand what the uniqueness of God means how different God really is from those things that are made is seen in the differences that exist among organisms that he created. So we get insight into God's uniqueness by studying discontinuity. We also see this amazing thing since we cannot derive uh, by evolution the deep discontinuities between uh, Brahmins. We can't derive the even deeper discontinuity between groups of Brahmins, and we cannot by uh, any means derive the greatest discontinuity between life and non-life, it means this, the only way we know to explain this is by a creator. So when we see these, this, this great depth of discontinuity in life, it impresses upon us that it must have been created. In fact, even this very shallow discontinuity between breeds can't be as far as we know, can't be generated by any natural process. It had to have been created by God. So the more we learn about discontinuity, the more we're impressed with the fact that these things have been created, that all of life has been created, from, from cultivars and varieties all the way up to life itself. That points to every time we do that, where we learn a little bit more about God as creator. We are uh, Perhaps we, I mean, we should be believing this anyway, but we become even more convinced that God is, uh, is the creator of things. It's the only way to explain what we see. The more we learn about discontinuity, the more we learn about God's distinctiveness, his, his uniqueness. But that means we learn more about what theologians call his transcendence, how he's much greater than those things that are made that he is beyond all things, uh, he is above all things. He is, he, is dis, he, is, he is not just another one of these things that we see about us. He is distinctly different. 
uh, infinitely different from those things that are. So we get a, a, an idea of his transcendence. We even we get this also by looking at the spectrum of perfection of discontinuity. When we see the extremely shallow discontinuity to the extremely deep discontinuity, and our minds try to extrapolate beyond that towards infinite distinctiveness, in infinite uh, difference, we begin to understand a better, better and better, what it means for God to be transcendent. Yet with all of this, he's placed this stuff into the biological world in such a way that we can discover it, we can recognize it, we can see it. And he created our brains able to recognize it and our senses able to, de to detect it. And he did that, that makes sense, he did that because he wants us to understand his nature. That's an awesome thing. The more we learn about uh, biological discontinuity, the more we uh, come to understand God's desire to be known. And I, I continue to be amazed with this. If he is so transcendent that, that he's of a completely different substance, uh, a com infinitely greater substance, infinitely greater being in every way, he is so distinct from us, why should he be interested in a relationship with us? Why should he? There, it seems that there's just no reason for it, except that is what God desires. It's awesome. We have this incredibly unique, uh, infinitely different God who wants a relationship with us. And, and so the more I study discontinuity, the more I'm impressed with these characteristics of God, the more I have to worship, I fall into worship of this amazing God. And again, I get excited about this and want to bring others into knowledge of this, share with them this incredible uh, discontinuity and what it means, this God who is so different but wants a relationship with myself and with you. That's, that's awesome. When I do that, of course, and I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. When we study the biological world, learn more about God, which causes us to erupt into worship, and then to bring others into that worship, we are fulfilling our responsibility as priests of the creation. It's not a hard job. It's a cool job. It's an amazing job. It's a fun job. It's something we ought to embrace and enjoy. And we should continue to that process of studying discontinuity. We've only begun the process of identifying the created kinds, of, uh, of classifying those created kinds. And as we should continue that, remember that the very first task that God gave to human beings, the very first task he gave to Adam was to name the animals of the garden. And then he was to leave the garden, he was to name and classify the animals and plants of the rest of the earth. We are still continuing that. That's the very first command given by God to humans. It's a high command. It's a, it's a royal command. We should continue this process for no other reason than for obe obeying God, but also so that we can see more of the nature of God in those things that are made. What is our responsibility as kings with this information? First of all, we are to preserve the pattern of discontinuity that we see. And one way to preserve that pattern is to try to the best of our ability to prevent organisms from going extinct. Every time an organism is gone, it takes away part of the pattern. We, we, get, we have a different view of life itself because we've lost some of the critters, some of the plants that were there before. So the more that we uh, can, can preserve or keep the species that exist, the more we can preserve the pattern of discontinuity that shows the very nature of God. And when it comes to a point where we have to make a decision, because sometimes as much as we try, uh, there is a species or a set of species that we just can't save. Sometimes we just don't have enough resources to save both, the, let's say, two different situations. Uh, one, e either one or both of these species are going to go extinct. If we po pool our resources, we might be able to save one and not the other. What if we have that situation? What if we have to make a decision between two species? Which one do we choose? 
Well, one criteria we can use if uh, what we've learned about uh, God and life is correct is that if one of those species is the only remaining member of a created kind, of a Brahmin, we should preserve that little fellow over the other. Let's say you've got a situation where you've got uh, 18 different species of fish in a particular Brahmin created kind, and one of those species is about, is, is about to go extinct. And you have another situation, and then let's say another fish species, that is about to go extinct, but he's the only known member of a created kind. It's, it's uh, very possible, uh, well, let's look at it this way. If you lost the species in this, that's all alone in its created kind, you've lost an entire created kind. You've lost the evidence of the deep discontinuity uh, that, that surrounds that particular thing. You've lost a tremendous amount of information. You've significantly altered the picture of life. Whereas if you lost one of many species that already exist in a created kind, it's, you can still see the discontinuity. You can still see the pattern of life. So if we have to make decisions, choosing to preserve species that represent the only known species from a Brahmin, uh, should be, they should be chosen to be saved before those that are represented by many species. But besides preserving the pattern, of course, as kings and as stewards, we should be enhancing the pattern of discontinuity that we see, making it better, making a better picture of God in among those things that are made. And I've already said that in our breeding practices where we've, where we've discovered cultivars and breeds by the thousands. And when we did that, when we revealed that hidden information that God placed in and among organisms, we actually uh, introduced a new, uh, a new type of discontinuity that the world otherwise would never have seen. We increased the, the, uh, the picture. We, we made the picture more complete, this spectrum of discontinuity that points to God's infinite uniqueness and thus we brought more glory to God. Because if we're honest, when we create, when we discover a breed and realize, I didn't make it, I just discovered it, it was already created and put in there somehow by God himself. If we understand that and say, wow, that's something God made, we bring glory to God in the process. Plus, when we introduce that new form, we have now increased our understanding of the discontinuity of life, and thus we have enhanced the pattern of discontinuity. So we should continue our breeding practices as we reveal more and more varieties and cultivars and breeds. We, in fact, enhance the uh, pattern of discontinuity that we find in life.